Welcome to the World War I History Podcast, produced by the MacArthur Memorial, a museum and research center dedicated to preserving and presenting the history of General Douglas MacArthur, which includes the story of World War I and that of the millions of men and women who served in that war. In October 2016, the World War I Historical Association hosted a World War I Centennial Symposium at the MacArthur Memorial. The symposium focused on the year 1916. The following is a presentation by historian Paul Walsh on the topic, Embattled Neutrality, the Western Hemisphere, Europe, and Woodrow Wilson. Uh, on the 4th of March, 1913, Woodrow Wilson was sworn in as the uh, 28th President of the United States of America, the first Democrat to hold his, this office since 1888, and the first Southerner since the Civil War. The Democrats uh, owed their victory primarily to a remarkable split within the Republican ranks, in which President William Howard Taft's re-election bid was challenged by former President Teddy Roosevelt and his newly formed progressive Bull Moose Party. Go Bull Moose. Wilson had, in fact, only received 42% of the popular vote. Uh, moreover, with less than two years of experience in politics as the governor of New Jersey, Wilson found himself at the head of a relatively weak and divided party, one which Taft had quipped was the, quote, organized incompetency, unquote, of the nation. Uh, by the beginning of 1916, with the approach of Wilson's contest for re-election, the new president had surprised everyone with the success of his first term, having stolen the thunder from the Republicans by repeatedly shepherding progressive legislation through Congress. In short, having imposed unity and discipline on his party, he had proven the Republicans wrong by demonstrating that Democrats could govern effectively. And by doing so, Wilson, both the leader and the man, had earned the admiration and affection of a great many citizens. Yet, despite the success of his domestic agenda, Wilson's prospects for re-election uh, were threatened by seemingly intractable challenges in, uh, for in foreign affairs on at least two fronts, Mexico and the World War. Wilson had never professed any aptitude for the international relations, as suggested by his uh, comment shortly before his inauguration that, quote, it would be the irony of fate if my administration had to deal chiefly with foreign affairs, unquote. That's always the way it is, isn't it? You get what you don't least expect. In particular, Wilson, like most presidents, found it exceedingly difficult to square his ideals with the brutal realities of revolution and war. Moreover, uh, Wilson was all too aware that whatever course he chose, his decisions would invariably have repercussions in domestic politics. With regard to both the upheaval in Mexico and the global conflict being fought between the European nations, Wilson had to somehow balance his personal desire to promote peace and democracy beyond the nation's shores with the need, as he envisioned it, to defend international law and the honor of the United States, all while, all while preventing the country from being dragged into war. It was a tall order. Uh, in 1910, the long reign of Mexico's autocratic ruler, Porfirio Diaz, came to an end with the outbreak of the Mexican Revolution, uh, a conflict that would last for over a decade. Uh, local strongmen vied for sole control over the country, resulting in a seemingly endless round of civil wars, producing a state of lawlessness in large sections of the country. Diaz had encouraged U.S. companies to develop Mexico's natural resources, particularly her oil and mineral wealth, so that both U.S. citizens and U.S.-owned property were present within the country and therefore endangered by the conflict. Within the nations located in and around the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico, a succession of re re Republican administrations had pursued what was termed dollar diplomacy, the marriage of private business interests with, with the influence of the U.S. government. The political instability in countries such as Cuba, Honduras, and Nicaragua had prompted U.S. intervention and occupation to defend the fruits of dollar diplomacy. Small wonder that the threat to U.S. lives and property in Mexico led big-stick Republicans such as Teddy Roosevelt to demand military intervention. President Wilson specifically condemned dollar diplomacy as both unjust and immoral. 
Resisting the pressure to intervene, he stated, quote, Mexico must struggle through a long process of blood and terror before she finds herself and returns to the paths of peace and order, unquote. Yet the very motives that compelled him to reject dollar diplomacy also tempted him to intervene for his own ideals of restoring peace and promoting the spread of democracy. In the Caribbean, he twice yielded to temptation when he ordered the Marines to occupy Haiti in 1915 and the Dominican Republic the following year. Moreover, the lives and property of U.S. citizens were indeed under threat, and therefore so too was the honor of the nation. On the 9th of April, 1914, a group of U.S. sailors who had been sent ashore in Tampico to purchase supplies were arrested by government troops in the name of the current president, General Victoriano Huerta. Although they were released and General Huerta apologized, uh, many in Congress from both sides of the aisle called for a declaration of war. The president was torn. He viewed General Huerta as illegitimate. Uh, the general had come to power by assassinating his predecessor, Francisco Madero and was determined to uphold the nation's honor, but he had no intention of entering into a full-scale war with Mexico. When Wilson learned that a large shipment of arms purchased by General Huerta was headed for Veracruz, he ordered the Navy to take control of the port city, an act that was intended to undermine the general's regime, uh, along with being the main destination for arms and supplies, uh, purchased abroad, Veracruz was a major source of funds for the regime by way of col the collection of port taxes. In the fighting that ensued on the 21st uh, through the 22nd of April, 17 Blue Jackets and Marines were killed and a further 70 were wounded while over 100 Mexicans lost their lives. Fortunately for all concerned, the ambassadors of the ABC countries, Argentina, Brazil, and Chile, came forward to offer their services as mediators, an offer that both Wilson and Huerta readily accepted. Their, offer, their efforts forestalled any escalation. Neither side, in fact, was seeking a full-scale war. Meanwhile, General Huerta was steadily losing ground against his opponents, resulting in his fleeing the country in July. In November, the U.S. servicemen were withdrawn from Veracruz, ending the incident. By then, a new foreign crisis from an entirely different quarter had arisen to bedevil President Wilson's administration. When the assassination of the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne ignited the powder keg of European defensive alliances, the United States looked on with equal measures of horror and fascination. However, unlike Mexico, with which the nation shared a lengthy border, the emerging conflict in Europe appeared to present no direct threat to the country. In fact, as it would transpire, the danger to the lives of U.S. citizens in the midst of the war in Europe would play a role in engaging the nation in foreign conflict in much of the same way as it had south of the border. On the 4th of, uh, on the 4th of February 1915, the government in Berlin declared the waters surrounding the British Isles a war zone warning that the citizens of neutral nations traveling on vessels passing through these waters did so at their own risk. President Wilson had formally declared the neutrality of the United States back on the 4th of August in 1914, stating, quote, We must be impartial in thought as well as action, must put a curb upon our sentiments as well as upon every transaction that might be construed as a preference of one party to the struggle before another. Unquote. Needless to say, the request for neutrality of thought was futile, but it reflected Wilson's very real concerns regarding the large number of citizens who had been born in one of the countries that were now engaged in the war, the so-called hyphenated Americans. Inevitably, the policies adopted by either Wilson's Democratic administration or the Republican Party would be judged by different sections of the electorate particularly different groups of hyphenated Americans, on the basis of whether they benefited or prejudiced either the Entente or Central Powers, uh, judgments that had definite political consequences. Whatever approach either Wilson or the Republicans chose to take towards the war would be shaped by factors outside of, the con of their control, specifically the actions carried out by the hostile powers in Europe. The most immediate concern, and indeed the issue that would dominate the neutral nation's relationship with the belligerents, was the freedom of the seas. Predictably, Great Britain followed its traditional strategy when dealing with a powerful enemy on the continent. The Royal Navy established a blockade on the North Sea 
preventing all ships, neutral or otherwise, from either sailing or exiting from German-controlled waters, seemingly unable, or at least initially unwilling, to use her high seas fleet to break the British blockade, the Imperial German Navy turned to a new technology, seagoing submarines, in an attempt to establish a counter-blockade of the British Isles. Germany's employment of U-boats would have serious diplomatic consequences. Submarines relied primarily on their stealth, both for their success and their survival. Initially, the German Navy sacrificed the advantage of stealth in order to follow the international laws governing cruiser warfare, that merchant ships should be searched for contraband, and if found, the crew should be allowed to depart before the vessel was sunk. However, the British introduction of Q-ships, merchant ship, merchantmen with hidden guns designed to surprise U-boats that sur surfaced to conduct a search, made the observation of the laws of cruiser warfare hopelessly impractical. As such, U-boats were simply ordered to torpedo vessels engaged in trade with, en with the enemy without warning, initiating unrestricted submarine warfare. President Wilson insisted that all belligerents uphold the laws governing the maritime trade, specifically the non-interference with neutral vessels, regardless of the challenges presented by new, new naval technology. He objected to the practice of the British blockade. But when the German government sought to equate their campaign of unrestricted submarine warfare with the Royal Navy's blockade, the president would have none of it. Wilson drew a sharp distinction between the interference with free trade and the taking of human life. On the 7th of May, 1915, President Wilson had just finished lunch and was preparing to play a game of golf when he was informed of the sinking by a U-boat of the great ocean liner Lusitania in the Irish Sea. At first, no loss of life was reported, but the truth same soon came to light. 1,198 passengers and crew had drowned, including 128 U.S. citizens. A great outcry arose, not just from Republican war hawks who had long been advocating interve intervention in the conflict. Wilson knew that he could have gone to Congress and easily obtained a formal declaration of war against Germany. Yet contemplating the horrors of war and hoping that the United States might still be saved from these horrors, he turned instead to diplomacy. Wilson dispatched an official message condemning Germany's actions, demanding a halt to unrestricted submarine warfare, reparations, and an official apology from the Kaiser. The note proved too much for the, his pacifistic Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, uh, who subsequently resigned. While Germany's reply failed to meet all the President's demands, it was suffi sufficient to avert war. The Lusitania crisis made it all too clear to the President that regardless of his hopes to avoid U.S. entry in the war, its likelihood was increasing as the fighting continued unabated. Consistent with the nation's long-standing aversion to maintaining a large professional army in peacetime, Wilson had always believed that the presence of such a force only served to encourage its use. But events had led to a gradual evolution in his thinking, so that by the summer of 1915, President Wilson had reversed his stance against preparedness. In November, he sent Congress a modest proposal for the expansion of the size of the U.S. Armed Forces. It drew criticism from both ends of the spectrum. Republican war hawks led by Teddy Roosevelt and Senator Henry Cabot Lodge derided the bill as thoroughly inadequate. But it was from within the ranks of the president's own party that the strongest opposition arose, viewing the expansion of the armed forces as merely the prelude to an entry into the war, a coalition of agri agrarian radicals, pacifist progressives, and socialists who were particularly strong in the South and West fiercely opposed the bill. Their leader was the Democratic administration's former Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan. Wilson sought to counter this opposition with the bully pulpit, embarking on a nationwide speaking tour. Despite his best efforts, by February of 1916, President Wilson was forced to accept a severely watered-down version of his program for increased preparedness. The bill that he signed into law authorized a sub substantial expansion of the fleet, but the Army's numbers were only doubled from a little over 100,000 to a mere 220,000. The disappointment was such that Wilson's Secretary of War, Lindley M. Garrison, tendered his resignation. The critical events of March 1916 would suggest that Wilson's call for preparedness were fully justified.
At about 4 a.m. on the 9th of March, the inhabitants of the tiny border town of Columbus, New Mexico, were awakened by gunfire as some 1,500 Mexican revolutionaries led by Francisco Pancho Villa galloped through the streets. A detachment of 250 troops of the 13 U.S. Cavalry Regiment were camped alongside the town and, having recovered from their surprise, set about engaging Villa and his men. In the light of day, the survivors surveyed the damage. Stores had been looted, numerous bu buildings reduced to ashes, and scattered about were dead Villistas and the bodies of 18 U.S. civilians and soldiers. Without hesitation, President Wilson authorized the dispatch of a punitive expedition into Mexico for the pur purpose of capturing Pancho Villa. Beginning on the 15th of March, 10,000 foot soldiers and cavalry, cavalry troopers under the command of Brigadier General John J. Pershing set out across the U.S.-Mexican border in what would turn into a wild goose chase lasting 11 months. Villa and his men, expert riders, operating in their own home territory easily evaded capture. The presence of a large army of gringos on the sovereign soil of Mexico, on the other hand, served to undermine the legitimacy of the government of President Venustiano Carranza, the very leader whose regime President Wilson sought to support. Fortunately for both Mexico and the United States, an escalation in a full-scale war between the neighboring countries was averted. As with the previous incident involving the U.S. seizure of Veracruz in 1914, war was avoided mainly because it was neither Carranza's nor Wilson's interest to start one. As for Villa, uh, he resolved his differences with Carranza's successor, General Alavero Al Obregón, in 1920, retiring to the peaceful life of a wealthy rancher, only to be killed in an ambush three years later. Less than 10 days after General Pershing led the punitive expedition across the Rio Grande, the trouble along the U.S.-Mexican border was overshadowed by events transpiring in Europe. On the 24th of March, a U-boat fired a torpedo at the French cross-channel steamer Sussex, blowing her bow clear off, resulting in the death of some 50 innocent men and women, men, women, and children. Accounts differ as to whether any of the 80 dead or injured were U.S. citizens, I don't, I don't understand it. How can how can that not be clear? I, I have different books saying nobody was injured. I have books saying four people were injured. I have books saying four people were killed. Doesn't make any sense. Anyway, just just a comment. Yeah. But in either case, the incident provoked outright outrage in the United States. Both Bryan's successor as Secretary of State Robert Lansing and Wilson's closest confidant, Colonel Edward Mendel House, now urged the president to break off diplomatic ties with Berlin. While he held back from a complete abandonment of diplomacy, President Wilson made his position crystal clear in a speech before a joint session of Congress on the 19th of April. Following a review of the events of the preceding 14 months concerning German submarine activity and the U.S. response to sinkings, Wilson warned that, quote, unless the imperial German government should now immediately declare and effect an abandonment of its present method of warfare against passenger and freight carrying vessels, this government can have no choice but to sever diplomatic relations with the government of the German Empire. On the 4th of May, the government, of Berlin, government in Berlin replied to Wilson's dire warning. Although they reaffirmed their objection to the British blockade, which was producing near starvation conditions within Germany, Berlin pledged, quote, to do its utmost to confine the operations of war for the rest of its duration to the fighting forces of the belligerents, thereby ensuring the freedom of the seas, unquote. The Germans had blinked. Unrestricted submarine warfare, at least for the moment, was suspended. Although he may not have real realized it at the time, Woodrow Wilson had scored a diplomatic victory that more than anything else secured his reelection in November. His critics, both war, hawk, war hawks such as Teddy Roosevelt and Senator ha Henry Cabot Lodge and pacifists such as William Jennings Bryan, had complained time and again of his approach to U.S.-German relations, which involved a careful balance of patience and firmness. Germany repeated, Germany's repeated violations of the laws of war at sea appeared to justify such skepticism, but now the presence critics were proven wrong. Wilson's dipl diplomatic maneuvering had achieved its goal of ending unrestricted submarine warfare without the necessity of shedding a single drop of U.S. blood.
When the Democratic Party opened its convention at St. Louis, Missouri on the 14th of June, the theme of Wilson's reelection campaign was intended to be, in the president's word, the fine gold of untainted Americanism. This was in response to concerns for the loyalties of so-called hyphenated Americans, recent immigrants from the belligerent nations. Such concerns would shortly be highlighted by the enormous explosion on the 30th of July of tons of ammunition waiting for shipment to Britain on Black Tom Island, which had been the work of German agents. Nevertheless, it was ranks of the party faithful, rather than Wilson, who ultimately chose the theme of the president's reelection campaign. The keynote, keynote speaker, former governor of New York, Martin H. Glenn, citing historical presidents that justified Wilson's patience and restraint, but when he sought to move on to other issues, the crowd of delegates balked. Sensing the mood of his audience, Glenn recounted case after case in which, in spite of provocation, the United States had refused to go to war. Responding to each example, the delegates shouted, What did we do? What did we do? And Glenn replied, we didn't go to war. We didn't go to war. The following day, Senator Ollie M. James of Kentucky delivered his address. Quote, without orphani orphaning a single American child, Senator James proclaimed, without widowing a single American mother, without firing a single gun, without shedding a single drop of blood, President Wilson had wrung from the most militant spirit that ever brooded above a battlefield an acknowledgment of American rights and an agreement to American demands, unquote. Shortly afterwards, the phrase, he kept us out of war, became the theme of Wilson's re-election campaign. The president and his advisors recognized that, anti -war that his anti-war stance could succeed in drawing away many of those progressives who had voted for Teddy Roosevelt in 1912, but were now alienated by his passionate insistence that the U.S. should intervene in the World War. Wilson redoubled his efforts to pass progressive legislation through Congress, such as child labor laws and workmen's compensation for federal employees. When conflict between the labor and management in the nation's railways threatened to produce a crippling strike, Wilson attempted to resolve the impasse through mediation. Having failed, he then pursued an alternate approach, persuading Congress to pass legislation establishing an eight-hour work, work day for rail, railway employees. Seeking to ensure that private business interests weren't alienated, the president also arranged for the passage of pro-business uh, legislation. The Republican Party opened its convention on the 7th of July in Chicago. Although it was still the majority party among registered voters, the split of 1912 produced deep wounds that weren't easily healed. At the heart of the matter was Roosevelt. Brimming with enthusiasm, Teddy sought the nomination. But most Republican leaders deeply resented Roosevelt's abandonment of the party four years earlier, a betrayal that had handed the presidency to the Democrats. Roosevelt had forfeited his chance to run once more as the Republican candidate, but the party could not afford to ignore the large number of progressive Republicans who continued to so support Teddy. As such, those party leaders who fought against Roosevelt's bull moose party were also disqualified from the nomination. Ultimately, the Republicans chose a safe candidate for their election campaign, one who would alienate neither the pro-Roosevelt nor the anti-Roosevelt anti factions, Charles Evan Hughes. In New York, Hughes had been a rising star in the legal profession and sealed his progressive credentials by exposing corruption in the utilities industries and life insurance companies. He had served as governor of New York, of New York State and was currently serving on the Supreme Court. Incidentally, he's the only Supreme Court judge that ever left the court to run for president. Uh, he had served, um, the, Hughes left the bench to accept the nomination of the Republican Party, but once he set off on the campaign, it soon became clear that as a candidate, Hughes was a little too safe. Among the key problems for Hughes and the Republicans was the lack of a clear differentiation between the opposing candidates. Both were idealistic and visionary sons of clergymen. Hughes and Wilson alike had risen to the top of their respective professions before entering politics and had served as reforming governors of their respective states, achieving success against entrenched political machines. 
Each was an admirable human being with integrity and intelligence who foresaw a greater role for the United States on the world stage. In short, Hughes basically agreed with all of Wilson's domestic policies so that he was unable to present a compelling alternative. One observer referred to Hughes as, quote, Wilson with whiskers, unquote. <laughs> The one area of disagreement, however, was in foreign policy. Yet it was this aspect of Hughes' campaign that presented the Republicans with their greatest conundrum. Hughes' criticism of the president's patience with, the, with Germany threatened to alienate the large block of hyphenated voters uh, who favored the cause of the Kaiser, including both German and Irish Americans. Moreover, Hughes' assertion that Wilson's efforts at preparedness had been far too feeble implied that he favored measures that were generally viewed as leading the nation closer to entering the war. This impression was reinforced by the support Hughes' candidacy received from Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt's extreme rhetoric, such as calling for universal military service and his insistence that the United States should have declared war in Germany over the sinking of Lusitania, further undermined used moderate positions. Naturally, Wilson and the Democratic Party were more than happy to promote the impression of a jingoistic Republican Party. In a speech delivered on the 30th of September, President Wilson labeled his opponents, quote, the War Party. Uh, in turn, the Democrats portrayed their organization as the Peace Party. Democratic leaders argued that a vote for use was a vote for the United States to enter the war and or invade Mexico. William Jennings Bryan, along with other Democratic notables, toured the western states where peace sentiment ran strong, proclaiming that Wilson had kept us out of war and, if re-elected, would continue to do so. The president's neutral stance was further enhanced by a recent falling out with Great Britain over the rejection of U.S. offers of mediation, her interference with U.S. mail, and her blacklisting of U.S. firms that did business with Germany. In response, Wilson had obtained from Congress legislation that authorized economic retaliation against the Entente powers, thus suggesting his even-handedness. As far as the hyphenated American vote, Wilson made little effort to court their support, playing upon nationalist sentiment throughout his campaign. In turn, the vocal support or, uh, for use expressed by groups such as German Americans and Irish Americans tend to hurt his candidacy among the general electric, uh, electorate. Ironically, like Wilson, the ultra-nationalist Teddy Roosevelt also rejected hyphenated Americans, thus weakening potential support for Hughes' campaign from that quarter. Among the aspects of Hughes' campaign that handicapped his efforts was his negative tone, which soured many potential supporters. Secretary of the Navy Josephus Daniels lamented, quote, that no campaign in the history of the country has been quite so marked by viciousness, bitterness, and invective. All the elements of hate and misrepresentation were brought into play, unquote. By the final week of the campaign, President Wilson's position appeared strong. He had won the endorsement of independent newspapers and magazines and leaders in what were formerly Roosevelt's Bull Moose Progressive Party. Both organized labor and farmers lined up behind the Democratic ticket. Nevertheless, Democratic leaders remained nervous. The Republican Party was still the majority among the registered voters, and the and news could count on strong support from the teeming masses in the Northeast. On Election Day, the 7th of November, the initial results seemed to confirm the Democrats' worst fears. Hughes had soundly beaten Wilson in the Northeast, and by evening, some papers were announcing Hughes' presidency. But as more results trickled in from the rest of the nation, Hughes' lead began to slip. As was expected, Wilson had won the anti-war West, including the traditional Republican states of Kansas and Utah. By the 9th of November, it was clear that Wilson, Woodrow Wilson had secured his re-election, though it was by the narrowest of margins. The Democrats had won California by only 3,773 votes, New Mexico by 2,530 votes, North Dakota by 1,725 votes, and New Hampshire by 56 votes. The great irony was that Wilson, who had won re-election with his slogan, he kept us out of war, was perhaps more aware than anyone else in the United States that, like it or not, the country would probably be forced to enter the war.
On the 4th of April, only four months after his re-election, and just short of a month since his second inauguration, President Woodrow Wilson received the declaration of war from Congress. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, suggestions, or comments, please contact Amanda Williams at amanda.williams at norfolk.gov.